first of all welcome professor rubina wonderful to have you here on the vidar by socon and i'd like to thank lakshmi shrikhande for giving us an opportunity to speak on this theme saving lives and rubina as far as i know she is an excellent worker completely dedicated to women's health she has been the president of cefog in fact she's done so much of work for cefog all the you know the southeast asian countries uh, they have got together and formed this wonderful organization and i've had the you know i, I would say i'm lucky to have interacted with rubina not just at bangladesh sri lanka and india but also at the very home grounds uh, at uh, lahore and both the times she has ensured that all the you know the delegates coming from the foreign countries particularly from india they were really taken care of and we just you know it was just like as though you are in your own country and another thing i'd like to share about rubina is uh, you know she herself is a professor she is working in a medical institute running her own practice but she also cares a lot for the women from the underprivileged areas and therefore today we have her talking about a very very important subject and that is you know what do you do about population stabilization we talk about contraception during the antenatal period and then what happens post pregnancy how do we take it up so rubina once more i never called you professor so let me have that privilege of saying professor rubina sohel aap uh, please aap kal ki note kar dijiye i would like to add a few words uh, uh, good evening everyone and uh, it is um, such a privilege for me uh, to uh, to chair a session with the two stalwarts i would say one is uh, professor rubina sohel and the other one is dr suchitra pandit so it is uh, really an honor for me uh, to be chairing your session and having dr suchitra pandit as the other chairperson for the session so really and this is this post pregnancy family planning is such a burning issue especially in the indian subcontinent and we are re really eagerly looking forward to to your talk you know what you have to say on this uh, subject so over to you now thank you very much uh, good evening uh, ladies and gentlemen i really feel that i am home uh, talking to all of you and what a lovely introduction thank you both of you and lakshmi my dear friend thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk i won't take a lot of time but i just want to congratulate india over here because i know foxy and all of you who are sitting here and many of you who are not here directly have been very working very hard for improvement of maternal health and uh, these uh, uh, meetings and symposia and webinars that you are holding are actually uh, instrumental in spreading the word for saving the mothers so thank you very much for this the topic of post pregnancy family planning i think is extremely important for our region and let me begin by just sharing with you the situation of the world population this is how my presentation is going to go so it's not a very long presentation but we hope to touch a couple of areas so you know the world population was 7.8 billion according to a un estimate in october 2020 and when i look at the population of south asia from the total world population it is a time for me to be ashamed because it is around 25% of the world population 1.9 billion so if we are one fourth of the world population and our area in terms of uh, uh, area we are much less than the world population in terms of resources we are much less than the world so we are putting a lot of burden on ourselves by having this huge population and that is one of the reasons that our maternal health issues and the neonatal health issues barely get time to improve this is actually a projection which shows us that what is going to happen in the year 2100 and if you look at it that in the year 2100 the maximum amount of issues of population will be either in the central or south asia or in the sub saharan africa and asia is coming up very significantly over here in addition to sub saharan africa and the rest of the country will not have issues in relation to population so i think this is an eye opener for us and many of us actually are already aware of it but we keep on thinking and working together to find solutions but most of the time we are unable to reach our targets so what do we do to deal with this rising population trend we do know that there is an urgent and a dire need to reduce the fertility of our population now the only thing which can reduce the fertility is 
to increase the uptake of contraceptive use. And in countries like India, like Pakistan, uh, like Bangladesh, where we have a lot of taboos, we have a lot of myths regarding contraception, it is really a very challenging task to increase the contraceptive use and to encourage the women to space out the births. We know that there's an inverse relationship between contraceptive use and fertility. So if we increase the contraceptive use, we will expect a reduction in the fertility. And if we keep on focusing on the modern methods of contraception, we hope to reduce the fertility and we can also contribute to slowing down this huge population growth. And that is the objective of today's presentation and all that talk of contraception that we keep on having off and on. I would like you to look at population and contraception in terms of human and reproductive rights. So if you look at the reproductive health competencies which are based on human rights, you would agree with me that family size and spacing is one of the rights of the women. And many a times you would also agree with me that this family size and spacing is not decided by the women, but by the men, by the mother-in-laws and other people who do not, should not have a right to make decision based on the women's. Now, every woman has a right to decide freely and responsibly on the number and spacing of children and to have access to information, to be educated and to be able to exercise the method that she chooses to use. From there, I want to take you to the Millennium Development Goals. So when the Millennium Development Goals were being practiced and we were trying to reach the Millennium Development Goals, we had a goal of goal five of improved maternal health. And we had goal three of promoting gender equality and empowerment of women. But what happened? By the end of the MDGs, we were not able to move ahead a lot in family planning. So family planning was a neglected area in MDG agenda. So when the post MDG agenda was being drawn, family planning came up as an essential component for the future. Now the future brought us SDG three, which meant health for all by 2030. Now in health for all 2030, it is envisioned that we have to make sure that we meet the commitment for improving and for supporting family planning. If we are able to support family planning, we will be able to meet our commitment of achieving universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services by 2030. But again, it is a challenging task. We are already in 2021, nine years to go and a lot of work needs to be done. And that is why my interest, Suchitra's interest, Lakshmi, and many more of us, we are seriously interested in putting things in place which will help improve family planning access and services in a way in which significant change in numbers can be made, which means the contraceptive prevalence rate. Now, as I said that in our area regionally, there are challenges in terms of our mindset and in terms of our beliefs and myths and misconceptions. But there are other things going on as well, that why is it that the women do not get access to family planning and what are the challenges that we face? So to me, the biggest challenge is, I think, that we do not have decision-making role of women. They are not bread earners. So when women do not bring money to the household, they do not bring the right for decision-making. So I think that the biggest challenge to contraception is that our women are not empowered. They do not have the decision-making ability and the decision-making rights. In relation to that, poor access to family planning services, lack of availability of affordable modern methods. So they have to be affordable court and uncourt. The motivated providers are lacking. And so most of the providers do not have enough motivation to encourage the women. And you would have heard this quite frequently for them to say that we have got so much workload to do. How can we find time to counsel the women to take up contraception? And we need to have motivators and we need to have counselors who are going to talk to the women. Actually, believe in me that we are the people who have to talk to our women. If we have motivators, it is a plus but we are the persons who are mainly responsible and all the healthcare providers who are providing midwifery services. Then lack of counseling and lack of technical knowledge is also a barrier. Lack of high quality services. So if one woman in the community has had a bad experience with an intrauterine device, all of the women in the community will not be keen to use the method. And I think that one of the key things that I want to talk about today is the women neglect in the postpartum period. They never come to us they stay back at home. So only 10% or so of the women are going to come back to us in the postnatal period. Hence, for family planning, lack of visit in the postnatal period is actually a missed opportunity. And this missed opportunity, despite efforts, has not 
we we are not have been able to change this opportunity which is missed into a positive perspective now if you look at it that worldwide there is a global unmet need of 214 million women of reproductive age now if you look at these 214 million women who have got an unmet need you will realize that the 84% of all unintended pregnancies are because of the unmet need of family planning 59% unmet need is there because people who think that they want to practice contraception but they are using methods which are traditional or abstinence or withdrawal method which have got high failure rates and when you talk and counsel to women most of them will say that we are already using a method and we would like to stick to our method and 155 million women are the ones who are not using contraception though they wanted to so this unmet need has to be looked into because most of this unmet need generates from sub saharan africa and south asia again we are the culprits as for other things as well so the best time to provide family planning services is the postnatal period and as i told you before that most of the women are not going to come back to us for a postnatal visit then what is the best time in the postnatal period to provide these services to me the best time is at the time when the woman delivers i'm not saying that we should do it to all the women but we should try to make use of this opportunity because another opportunity sometimes may not arise now this beautiful window of opportunity solves three issues for us issue of access issue of availability and issue of affordability because when the woman is with us in our facility we have an opportunity to talk to them to convince them we have trained providers who can provide the service now i just want to share this paper with you and it was a paper published in 2019 october which just talked about the provision of postpartum care to women giving birth in health facilities in sub saharan africa and this is a very interesting study because it just proved what we are already talking about and it also told us that if we are able to provide good quality postpartum care for our women if it is priori prioritized it not only helps in terms of family planning but it helps in the continuum of care in terms of maternal health in terms of newborn health and in terms of child health as well so this is a window of opportunity which should not be let go and should be utilized in 2013 figo actually started institutionalization of immediate ppiud services and this was an initiative which they started in a couple of countries of the world and india was also one of the countries and the focal person or i would say the the thought behind this whole project and the leader of this project was none other than professor sabaratna marul kumaran who took the lead in this initiative now the objective of this initiative was that they wanted to produce a highly cost effective method which is going to address the global unmet need for contraception and when we talk about the global unmet need for contraception we are actually talking about south asia and the sub saharan africa so the project ended in various countries between 2018 and 20 so india sri lanka nepal kenya tanzania these were the countries in addition to bangladesh where the project was still running till to end of 2020 so these were the countries where what they did was that they trained the staff the community midwives and the healthcare workers and the staff who were providing the services for ppiud insertion and they wanted to institutionalize the practice of counseling on postpartum family planning in the antenatal period then training and then utilizing the opportunity to insert immediately after delivery an intrauterine device what did they achieve so in the six project countries they trained 9638 providers which is a significant number they enabled 7 lakh women to receive balanced postpartum family planning counseling and out of these women 74000 although i keep on wondering that when they counseled 7 lakh women only 74000 opted for ppiud but still 74000 opted for ppiud and they used it as a chosen method which is very good result and what happened in various countries so different countries use different models sri so lanka basically adopted it into the government policy and the government pledged to provide postpartum contraception across all hospitals in sri lanka india created a beautiful model of task sharing between the doctors and nurses bangladesh trained their midwives in ppiud counseling and insertion tanzania included pre service training for the healthcare providers about ppiud and nepal developed and implemented two new training modalities for the same 
I'm coming to the end of my presentation if we are getting anxious about time. So I just want to share with you before I say, because I want to make a point. And the point is that it is doable. Counseling is not that difficult as we think. And we do not need separate people coming and talking to the women because the best person to the talk to talk to the women and their husbands are the healthcare providers who are dealing with the women because they trust us the most. And I'm sharing with you this one data from one facility from Pakistan where I work, when in 2014, we decided that we needed to do something. Actually, in 2013, we decided that we needed to do something about postpartum family planning, and we wanted to use our own department as a model to see what kind of effect it would have. So what we started doing was that we started counseling our patients at two times during the antenatal period at 28 weeks, and then repeated it at 34 weeks of pregnancy. And by that time, we help the women to choose a contraceptive method. Our main focus was on modern methods of contraception, but in places where women were not willing to choose any modern method of contraception or were unsure, we did suggest them Depo or Sinopress. So this was the way, and in some cases, we also encouraged them to take injections, etc. So in this way, we started. And when we started, the, when the decision was made for the method chosen, we used to put a stamp on the antenatal card. When the women would present to us during labor, uh, once again, they were counseled and they were told that this is the process that is going to be followed and the PPIUDs were inserted. So when we started, the first year that we started, that was 2014, our PPIUD uptake rate was 20%. And for that, we obviously beforehand trained not only our uh, senior registrars, but actually the trainees were trained. They were provided regular training. Uh, because, you know, the batches are also changing. So the changing batches were trained in the game. So this whole program was followed up by a program of training and revision of training. And sometimes we would identify issues with competency, but at other times there were issues with the level of confidence of the trainees. So if we found that according to the data, some trainees were not using the method, then we would call them and ask them questions and retrain them and then send them again to do the same. So from 2014, 20% PPIUD, we went to 2020, 62%. And if you would just allow me to share the data. Uh, so what did we do was that we talked about PPIUD, we talked about uh, implants, GDEL, in some patients, obviously, you know, who have repeated operations, cesarean section, they go for BTL. And the ones who didn't want to do anything, we said, okay, we will give you a depot or a sign up press before we use to discharge these patients home. So if we include the GDEL, BTL and depot, etc., our contraceptive uptake before the women went home was 88%. And when the first time I presented this data, nobody would believe me. And they thought that we were just making it up. But then we invited people over and we said that you need to come and see what do we do. So to me, it was a huge change. The objective of sharing this with you is that it is actually doable. And I hope that some of the trainees are also watching this because 90% of these PPIUD insertions were actually done by the trainees of obstetrics and gynecology. So what is our way forward? The first lesson for me, at least, is that the antenatal care is a golden opportunity to talk about contraception and to make up their mind what kind of contraceptive method they wanted to choose. Immediate PPIUD insertion after delivery is actually a golden opportunity. And if you miss this, miss this opportunity, sometimes women don't come back. The government has to take a, a very, very... Um, a serious role in this for institutionalization of PPIUD into our everyday practice. So PPIUD has to be a part of the government policy and PPIUD also has to be a part of the curriculum, not only of the midwives and doctors, but also of LHVs. So that, and also I would say of the paramedical staff because they need to be talking about the importance of contraception. And that is here where I would like to end by saying that this is possible, this is doable, we just need to put our head together, our minds to it, and try to make sure that we universally make this accessible in all the facilities where delivery care is being provided. So to conclude, I have three important messages. One is that it is the right of the women to choose what contraception for how long they want to use it. It is our responsibility as healthcare providers to ensure that the women get this right. And we also have to ensure that this window of opportunity 
of post delivery family planning should not be missed with this i would like to thank you very much and i am open for questions and answers thank you thank you very much uh, professor rubina uh, along with the population stabilization i think you brought out the point very beautifully a woman has a right to choose what contraceptive she wants to choose i think excellent uh, you know slides and i'd also like to mention here that you know we are talking so much about environmental stabilization i think if we look towards population stabilization and if we get that in control and environmental is also you are going to be automatically yeah. protected i think that's very very uh, you know a, a great talk i just like to ask, ask one question how has the implant done in you know other areas of southeast asia uh, particularly and the implant has it uh, been taken up well uh i think you know there is this um there is this stigma of iud at least i i think that it is in india as well but it is in pakistan definitely there in bangladesh it is there in india it is there so when we offer women another long acting method they actually grab that opportunity many of them don't feel comfortable having a device inserted into the uterus and they feel comfortable having a device inserted into the arm so in pakistan the response is very good unfortunately the problem in pakistan is of supply and you would have noticed in my presentation and in 2020 there were very few implants which were inserted the reason was not patient choice but the reason was lack of availability in the country which was a huge problem so to me for pakistan uh, the implants are taken looked at it very favorably and women are very keen to use them although for me personally i am a copity supporter But the implants are very popular. Hi, Rubina. Salam alaikum. So come, Rubina. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rubina, thank you so much. Yeah, I was just wanting to. You logged in. Nagna just told me. You yeah. logged in, and I am really having fond memories of our Nepal trip. You, me, and Ruma. I know. I'm yes. really looking forward to another trip with you. We, we need to have a lot of trips together because this last year has been terrible for all of us. So we will compensate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So one of the issues we have, Rubina, is uh, in a country like Papua New Guinea, which is a very poor country, yeah. and a country like Fiji. Both companies that make Implanon and Mirena refuse to reduce their price. Yes, absolutely blank refuse. Uh, even if we were to ask them to give us a cost price, they will not do that. So my plea really is that if india has slapped the world with pharmaceuticals by bringing the prices down to 20% making it affordable to every single poor person in the world why does india or pakistan find it so hard to actually produce mass produce copies of merina and uh, because i think it is very shameful on the part of these companies that they will not they will put profit before lives of women in developing countries because at the end of the day as you know very well women if they don't child space their risk of dying just gets higher and higher and higher and higher yeah um and so that was so that was my first question and my second question is um, have you ever had any experience of putting um implanon in pregnant women <laughs> because okay. i'll tell you why we yeah. go in the highlands of uh, papua new guinea where they, there might be only one opportunity for them to ever see a doctor ever for 4 or 5 years thank you very much for two excellent questions ajay and it is a pleasure to see you you know uh, when i see you it brings a smile to my face that is <laughs> what i can say so thank you for asking these questions regarding your first question uh, you know uh, i totally agree with you that why can't we produce the same which we are looking at the world to provide us at uh, less cost and because nobody is going to reduce the cost for us so in pakistan currently we are exploring uh, pharmaceutical companies and we are talking to the government to give 
uh, opportunities to the pharmaceutical countries in terms of tax rebate, etc., who are able to produce uh, marina, copper tea, etc. So there is some work going on, and I hope and wish that this work would lead to some substantial solutions for our region. Because I think I agree with you that it is extremely important that we start producing our own stuff. It is extremely important. The second thing is till the time we are not able to do so. I actually don't mind the cost because our governments are spending much more on producing six and seven babies and providing the healthcare coverage to those people. So if the government will reach analyze that money to contraceptives, it would be much better rather than helping women produce more babies. So I think that the governments need to understand that this is a good investment for them and uh, it will reduce the mortality as well. The second question regarding uh, Ajay, regarding the use of implanon during pregnancy, I think it's a beautiful, very well thought of question. You know, when we started, I was talking about my department and uh, as you noticed, we put implant on before they used to go home. So many people started talking about it when we were discussing ourselves that you are giving progesterone when the woman is breastfeeding. So we looked it up in the literature and nowhere did we find that we could not put an implant on at that time, or we could not give a progesterone injection at that time. So if a woman is not ready to choose any method, we say, okay, take a progesterone injection. It will cover you a couple of months and then you come back. And the people we home with, we were debating our gynecological colleagues and OBG colleagues. They said, you know what? The woman is breastfeeding and you are giving an injection. What is the point? I said, the point is that this is the only opportunity we have. We won't get any other opportunity, so we have to give us something. And if I look at, uh, at your comment from that perspective, I think whatever they did, they did the right thing. Because progesterone is not going to harm the pregnancy in any manner, and still it would be there when they deliver. So I think, well done. I would be supporting it. Thank you. And uh, we have WHO support as well on that. Okay. The Excellent. Moment. Excellent. So, so uh, would... thank you, uh, Dr. Rubina Sohel, uh, for this um, highly comprehensive and brilliant talk on postpartum uh, family planning issues. Um, I'm sure all our attendees would have benefited a lot. The best part is uh, that, uh, well, um, I mean, the, the, what you highlighted, you know, regarding um, counseling during the antenatal period, which a lot of us tend to miss. So that's a very important point that you picked up, you know, counseling at 28 weeks and 34 weeks. Very important in our, in our um, uh, prevalent uh, scenario. And uh, especially the, the other two points, you know, regarding women empowerment and accessibility are also points to be really pondered upon and uh, the time is time to 2030 is very short and hurdles and challenges are too many so i think we all have to work together to attain this um, sdg <coughs> goal so thank you so much thank you, thank you. for your